Welcome back. Uh, if you just joined us, uh, you're watching Connections. We're talking about several issues, uh, guns and doctors and micro steel and the economy. I tell you, we, we go around the world in half a second. Now we're going to talk about privileges. You know, if you don't know, many professions have what they call, uh, I guess, professional client privileges. You yeah. know, law for lawyers, you have an attorney-client privilege. You can't say what the client tells you in confidence if they're hiring you. Dr. Gomez, you, uh, tell us about the medical field. How does that privilege communication issue uh, play into what you do as a physician? Well, the, the essential element in this uh, problem is uh, a matter of how the historic relationship between a physician and patient has now been infringed upon by the way we have systems acting on it. And I think we've already on this show covered uh, things such as practice profiling, which examines exactly how patients are being taken care of, the choices that are being made by the physician for the care of that patient are being monitored. And it limits their ability to make choices that are not, say, preset on a particular panel. Those are, uh, a, a particular approach may not be reimbursed or uh, sanctioned, and now that's off the table. But moreover, uh, and leading from what we were just discussing, there are uh, attempts, not just the, like the one we just discussed with regard to uh, limiting the ability of a physician to ask questions of a patient, legitimate questions with regard to their health, uh, but also a variety of other uh, regulatory processes that make no particular good sense, they just become policy. Uh, and I think we're going to be speaking about that a little well, bit. Well, let me ask Michelle on the down low here. If a patient comes to you and says, Doc, you know, I, I got this disease, that disease, or I haven't been using protection, whatever, whatever, do you have a duty to alert the authorities that this person here has just confided to me that they are having unprotected sex and they might be HIV positive or any other? Uh, diseases, or if just any disease, can you just say, "Hey, Joe, you know my friend, I guess who just came in," <laughs> and it's what they said. Do you have any? I could parameters? say it, and then I could be sued. Okay. <laughs> but um, you know, there are things that are reportable. There are certain diseases that are, you know that are reportable. Chlamydia, gonorrhea. You know, there you you have to report these um, with a name and you know the person and so on. And then it's upon it. You take it up the. Um, Department of Health takes it upon itself to notify partners, you know, in the case of HIV or so on, if that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. So we don't do any mm -hmm. notifying of anybody, no. Mm -hmm. um, but we do report certain diseases, yes. Donna, let's talk about uh, attorney client privilege. Yes. Uh, I think we were talking before the show that this was the most important. Oh my God, it's the strongest uh, privilege. Understood. It's the what, most what, protected. What privilege uh, can a client expect when they tell you something in confidence as a lawyer? And, and I, I, that what clients can expect when you engage with uh, an attorney for advice, that's even in a consultation kind of setting, is that whatever uh, the scenario is that you, or whatever the situation is that you disclose to the attorney, it's protected, which means he, uh, the attorney can't disclose that to anybody. And um, if, if the government or anybody else tried to get the attorney to disclose, it is protected. And so the, the attorney doesn't have to uh, respond to, in most cases, to any demand by the government to disclose or by any other entity to disclose what the exchange was between them. And, and why is that? Well, that's to get people to open up and, and uh, have, that, have a trusting relationship But also, but also with so that you can do a better job of protecting right. your client, correct? That too. So yeah. this is the same type, and this goes to medical ethics, this is the same type of threat that... Uh, is deteriorating the ability to care for a patient. I patients would Patients wouldn't open up. And if they're fearing that there's going to be uh, repercussions either to you or even the physician to whom you're disclosing information, they're going to be closed-mouthed and not, not trust, mm -hmm. hence not admit things that may, in fact, um, uh, impinge, you know, and impact their health adversely. Are there any statements that you must report? Like, I just killed somebody. Oh, yeah. I just shot somebody. Oh, I'm, absolutely. I'm, I'm or I'm leaving your office and I'm going to blow my wife's head off right now. Yeah, you you, you got to you gotta tell them. I mean, that kind of stuff. You, you cannot you, it's, not protect, it's not protected. If you know he has the ability to do this and he's serious. Well, once it's happened, he says, I just killed somebody. Must, can you say, well, he just admitted uh, 
know that he kills you know why well, if he you comes know, to you in confidence as to, to for representation okay. no okay but unless he's gonna but do if it. it's a threat yeah, but you can't something. take judgment. You can't take judgment out of the equation, and that's part of the problem. Wouldn't you agree? Mm -hmm. See, if you have a, a patient with a psychological problem, uh, a psychiatric disorder, you, you can't act on every single statement that individual makes as if it were actually verifiable fact. You may have to take it into context, and your professional judgment is what allows you to care for that individual, and not just say, "Well, you know what? I have to get this guy arrested. Let me call the police immediately and have him uh, or her." Uh, put in jail, when in fact what they may be requiring is an antipsychotic medication. Mm -hmm. Now, medical records are not protected by any privilege. Either. If somebody comes in and you have uh, all kinds of notes on them, all kinds of disease, what medicine you gave them, what they're suffering from, uh, that can be obtained by another party in a lawsuit, I suppose. They can be subpoenaed by a, a, by, a, a, a legal well, by legal So the HIPAA process. only protects them from being transferred to other folks without the legal necessity to have it. Yeah, right. but I, I don't think they're protected by privilege. They're protected by the privacy laws, aren't they? Right. Okay, so it's not a privilege. No. The privilege is any communication between you and your patient. Mm -hmm. is, right. is, but I, I want to be clear. That's, that's closer to, to the dynamic. Remember, we're not yeah. dealing in legal matters generally speaking. So what we're talking really is privacy of personal, uh, yeah, of closely but, held information. You know. But that person gives you an information that you write down, so technically it's part of what the person is telling you, even though it's regulated by the HIPAA uh, from disclosure, but it's still something you get from the person telling you about what they are going yeah, to do. Absolutely. You know, the, the IOM uh, was kind of the impetus for the start of these IOM HIPAA laws. Being? Oh, the, the Institutes of Medicine, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, a think tank in uh, Washington, D.C., a, a sort of uh, intellectual elite of medical leaders, uh, and they were concerned about how this information, how medical information needed to be protected, and appropriately so. Um, but the bigger threat has always been the corporatization of medicine and how this information might be fed into systems to profile a patient and how that can be used in marketing or sold off, just like your information on Facebook or uh, any other of the uh, social uh, networks might be sold off for uh, commercialized interest. Now, you can't do that. If you, if you did that for every patient interaction uh, and it were available to insurances and we're, we're talking about an insurance system that is prior uh, to impact by the current health law, which would compel them to maintain individuals on their health plans rather than drop them if they be basically become too expensive, um, that's really where it came from. That's really what it was heading towards. Not to interfere in simple interactions between a patient and a doctor trying to establish cause of disease and, and care for the patient. Donna, let's look at the other aspect, the CPA. I think I remember in law school there was all kinds of other privileges, uh, psychiatrists, psychologists. Yeah, but they're CPAs. flimsy. Most of them, um, the privileges but are But let's talk about the CPAs because a lot of people hate the IRS because the IRS takes all your money every year, people feel. What if uh, somebody goes to a CPA and says, look, you know, I don't want to pay taxes. I want to cut this corner here. I want some loopholes. Is there a, pro a privilege to I, I'm not aware the that CPA? there is a, a privilege that protects. Because if you go to your CPA knowing that, look, I'm, what I'm telling you is confidence. I'm cheating on my taxes. I don't want to pay all these taxes, no, and I don't, turns I don't, around and say, hey. I, you know. I'm not aware, and I could be wrong, but I'm not aware of a privilege that protects them. It's different if you go to your attorney and you say, listen, I cheated on my taxes, and you disclose and that information. Next year. I, I'm tired of paying my Well, taxes. if you say I'm going to cheat again next year, then you, 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 <laughs> you drift out of protection. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if, I, I, I'm not aware that there is a privilege between the, an accountant well, and, and, an accountant and, the, pay, and the, the client. But there's, but there's legal and then there's legal. I mean, yeah. what, what we're talking about is, yeah, there's, there are medical, there are, sorry, there are ethical rules that also govern uh, CPAs. Oh, yeah. And, and they, they should abide by them. But I, I guarantee you, that there are individuals out there who say, don't worry, we'll do something. Well, yeah, it's all a matter of the language. They would make money if they were ethical all right. the time. I mean, you know, so a lot of them well, are not I, going I don't, to Well, I don't be. disagree. You see, it, it is, in fact, partially a matter of interpretation with regard to your accounting process. Because if uh, your, your accountant is using legal loopholes, there, there isn't anything illegal going on there. Yeah. This, the, 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 you, the very fact that you were calling it a loophole. I'm sorry? Not, fake documents. Or no, no, but that's, that's actually yeah. a misrepresentation. We're, we're talking not lying, but actually looking at the current tax law and saying this you're entitled to by law. So yeah. 
that, well, that I agree with. But that's yeah. t- you know the situations I'm talking about are those legal loopholes that they squeeze you into when really you shouldn't be into the ones that, in, that cause you Donna, to end up in trouble. Let me throw something at you. You do immigration law. A couple comes in and say, you know what? You just got married. I want to apply for for, for permanent residency. But you know, I paid her five thousand dollars, and she says she's going to do it for me. Do you run out of the room then? You say, I well, don't I don't run out of the room, but I'm like, listen, I cannot represent anybody in a fraudulent uh, marriage. And but, if you're telling me that you paid her and that is the reason why she married you, I cannot represent so you. Might, so you might restate it and tell your client, so you didn't actually say. No, I, I, I'm not going to restate nothing. <laughs> or, <laughs> we on camera. Or are you sure you paid? I'm not going to restate anything, my- <laughs> but I'm going to make it clear to you. If, uh, if you are telling me that you paid her $5,000 and that is the reason she married you and that's the only reason she married you so you can get a, an immigration benefit, I cannot represent but, you. But okay, are there but lawyers that have bills given, that? Oh, lots of, course, of them. But this question though, do you have an obligation to, <laughs> At least you're to about disclose? That. <laughs> you have an obligation to disclose that this person just said they committed a crime. No, do, I don't believe, I, I'm not aware of any affirmative obligation that puts us in a position where we have to, we do have to not partake in yeah, it. Yeah, but what's the difference when it's, I'm going to kill somebody tomorrow, I'm just committed a crime, I'm going to go to immigration and ask for a benefit. Yeah, but you kill somebody, that person's life is over, and, and, and that's, you know, that's one thing. You become a U.S. citizen. It may be a positive thing for America. Okay. You know, I'm just saying. Uh, hey. I'm just saying, you know. You, you hit it right on the head. Uh, on the head. <laughs> you watch your connection, we'll be right back. Don't go away.